more for the Twitch people to look at us or me to look at the Twitch people. Okay, so I uh, missed you all last week. I hope you rested up and studied your ports while I was gone. Everyone have fun hacking uh, task ports and exception ports and stuff. Define fun. You know fun. It was fun. How do I do this again? Okay. Uh, and so, before we can get on to the real fun, um, we have a giant thing blocking us in our way. So, let me paint you a picture of what my life was like. I don't need the latest version of the Twitch app. Just get me to the page. There we go. Okay, so uh, maybe you will find some uh, solace in your own reverse engineering or frustrating other things. I spent, uh, I tried to get kernel extensions. I have a great kernel extension that we used in DEF CON 2028, or 2018. I have verified that it works. I've, uh, it still compiles and builds and I've have great plans of building up this IO kit level where you have to just first talk to IO kit to get a flag and then you go progressively more and more until you actually exploit this vulnerability, culminating in like actually exploiting the real DEF CON challenge that existed then. Um, the problem was in this process, trying to get as I think I've mentioned, we have virtual machine, we're using Apple's virtualization framework to run all of these um, virtual machines in the infrastructure but I kept not being able to load the kernel extension. It kept giving me errors saying this kernel extension, it said uh, uh, there was an error building the kernel extensions or, or building the kernel cache, please restart. So the first big problem was making it allow. So like this is what I mentioned earlier, this problem of like having to approve kernel extensions is insanely annoying, which is great for the users because you don't want kernel extensions just to pop up into your system. But for me, a person who wants to run these VMs, just write a kernel challenge, have it automatically loaded. Uh, that was a pain. But then, so I originally thought, oh, it's because I'm on the latest version of Mac OS and the ones I'm targeting are 12.5, the one that we're running on. So what I need is an older version of the SDK to run. So I downloaded an older version of Xcode that was for that. It does not run on these systems, it's too old. But you can symlink in the SDK from your Xcode to point to the other Xcode so you can specify that version of your build. Did that, same error, still couldn't figure out what was going on. Uh, then I said, oh, it's because I don't have, maybe the problem is I need to build it on that machine with that version of Xcode. So I try that, I copy Xcode over, and then I realize I don't have enough space to install Xcode. Xcode is too big for those, it's only a 50 gigabyte disk image, which sounds insane to say only 50 gigabyte image, but it's too small for the that, so uh, that didn't work. And then I said, you know what? This will be, I definitely can figure this out. I'm just gonna like develop the challenge, develop the challenge, figured out how I was gonna make this work, and then um, went back to do that, and I was like, okay, let's see if this kernel extension works. So I installed it on my local machine. It works, I actually, I don't think this can impact any of you, but I actually am still running it. I haven't uninstalled this vulnerable kernel extension. It is now running on my, this physical laptop right here. Um, and so I said, okay. So I tried all the different ways of loading the same kernel extension on the virtual machines. None of those worked. I tried, then I said, okay, let's set up a virtual machine that's the exact same version of the operating system as this version here. And then install the exact same kernel extension that I could install on this laptop and it still did not work. And that's when I should have probably done the first thing of Googling that error message and virtual machine and third-party kernel extensions, where you get to this very nice uh, GitHub issue of UTM. So UTM is a very popular open source, um, kind of like VMware style thing for the Mac. So it allows you to run virtual machines. You can run virtual machines with uh, that run using Apple's hypervisor stuff or with QMU. And the exact same issue, third-party kernel extensions like MacFuse or the kernel extension that they're working on won't load. 
After reboot, I get a pop-up message that says system extension error. An error occurred with your system extensions during startup and they need to be rebuilt before they can be reused. This was the exact error message I kept getting over and over and over again. I disabled SIP. I also didn't mention all the other things I tried to disable. There is um, SIP is a set of bits that get set in this register. And so there's other bits. So I tried flipping those other bits and seeing if they did it. Nothing worked. Um, and this resulted in a giant. So you can see this bug was reported in May of 2022. This resulted in, it seems like a year plus of reverse engineering, trying to figure out why this kernel, why third party kernel extensions were not loaded. Um, probably a thing to bring up is that these are, uh, the kernel extensions, um, it's is not very much not like Linux. You can't dynamically load a kernel extension into Mac OS. It like refuses to do that. Uh, the reason is, the, probably for performance reasons, the kernel is completely pre-linked. So the kernel and all the extensions are pre-linked and that's what it's called the kernel cache. It's the pre-linked of everything. All the kernel, all the extensions, drivers, everything at runtime. So when you load a kernel extension, what you're saying, telling to the operating system is, please include this kernel extension and rebuild the kernel cache. And then you reboot and that's why reboot takes a long time and you upgrade because it has to rebuild and relink all of the kernel uh, stuff. Um, so, um, this bug has existed for apparently two years, over two years now. And I will save you the pain of, uh, of this, this level, actually, this is like really, if you want to like see how people reverse engineer this stuff, this is actually a very good like play by play commentary of how somebody went through and reversed this. We'll, we won't go through their whole steps. We're going to go through the steps of how they actually did this. Uh, but basically what, and there's also several dead ends in here. So there's also like, oh, I tried this. I think it's this problem. I think it's this kernel extension that's missing because one thing they tried was diffing the extensions that were on the VM and the extensions that are on the physical machine. And you can see that there are differences and they tried to like try to force some of the ones to run or to load. Um, anyways, not working. So the, uh, let's see, when was this posted? So, see, I love this. This is, uh, I guess from June to December, a lack of progress report. Um, I love that. Um, let's see, uh, lots of good debugging. Let's see, where are we? Uh, testing on each version, because this is when you have a bug like this, each time you get access to a new beta, a new version, you have this hope that your bug will be fixed and that just this version will work. This still has never, has not happened. Um, so, yeah, and then somebody else commented of like, I think this may be the problem. And, yeah. So here, September of 2023 from what, June of 2022, a year and three months to find out a way to make this work which uh, I will just scroll through this, is insanely long. Well, these are mostly comments about it, cleaning it up, but these are all the steps. So basically the theory is that um, on modern systems, including um, Mac systems, Android definitely has this as well, there's a secure processor. In Apple, they call it the secure enclave. In, in Android, it's, I think, the trusted trust zone because it's like, right, trusted world with a trusted execution environment, a TEE. Basically, you can think of it, I think Mac thinks of it as like a separate processor. Um, uh, on Trust Zone, it's the same processor, but different uh, registers and everything. But the idea is it's a completely separate thing where you can do secure stuff. And when you're running a virtual machine, you don't want them that virtual machine to have access to the same secure thing that your hardware is running, right? You want to virtualize that. So they have virtualized that in software, the Enclave, but it doesn't fully support everything that the processor does. So as part of loading, it tries to talk to the secure enclave and as part of rebuilding the cache, it sends it some command that it can't do anything with and that blows up the whole process. Um, so what this person decided to do is um, to patch 
basically patch that out. But to patch that out, you can't just change the code because that's, uh, let's say the code, I can't remember if it's running in the operating system, whatever the final thing is, because of the root of trust that is built. So does somebody remember what the root of trust is from your security learnings? Oh, didn't know this was gonna be interactive, huh? Yeah, so you want to establish that nothing was modified or changed. And so to do that, you have usually a part zero that is burned into your system. That's some code that's the very first thing that runs. And then it runs a check of your phase two code, computes some hashes, checks, and then only if it matches, then it loads the phase one and phase one then checks phase two, make sure everything's there. And then that checks your kernel to make sure your kernel's not messed up. And then finally your kernel loads. And so now you've established a root of trust that you're, nobody has messed with because this way you could just easily load in a new bootloader, load in a new BIOS, just change the hard drive, and now you've completely compromised the system and the system thinks it's secure, but it's not. Um, so on a normal system, you can't change any of the bootloader or anything like that because it's burned into a hardware piece on your system. Luckily in the virtualization world, that has to run in software. So it runs on the host that has to run that phase zero bootloader that then verifies phase one and then phase two. So you have to patch out all of those things so that you can finally patch out the thing that you want to then get caches working. And that's what we're gonna do today. This will be a, uh, hopefully, my goal is for this to be an interactive experience because there's a lot of stuff in here that I don't really do a ton of, like binary hex editing image like IMG formats and stuff, that if there's better ways that you know how to doing it, you can definitely say that. Uh, Cause I'd like to kind of keep track of what we're doing so that maybe we can release scripts to do this or something. So it's not so insane as of a process as we'll see. And I think it'd be fun to like reverse engineer a little bit of like what these changes are. Um, because it probably, even though we're looking at stuff in the virtualization framework, I would highly, I guess it would be highly likely that that same code is in the, um, in the actual, like, on the systems for iBoot. Um, questions? Mm -mm. Well, this is live. The only thing I slightly did was look at, because I really don't want to use Ghidra, and they use Ghidra in a few steps. Ghidra sucks. It's Java. Don't you guys look at this and see, like, wow, this looks like an app that was written in 2000. It's the same. It's like a wide open. Okay. This is much better. Look at how pretty this is. Um, it looks like a Java app. It does not look Okay, look, here's the key thing that's different. It's the key thing that's different. You're using a Mac app. Where do you expect to find the file menu? Where do you expect to find the file menu? Like here, Safari. Where's the file menu? Uh, yeah. On the top of what? The top bar. Yeah, the top bar of the entire window, right? Mac is designed so that you will never lose track of where these things are and the Apple menu in the upper right. This is like a fundamental design principle of the Mac that comes from like computer interface theory that like it's actually faster if these are always in one place of going to them. If they're always, anyways, there's like a whole bunch of like uh, HCI theory behind this. Um, and if you look in Java, I can tell right away, where's the file menu here? Yeah, it's here. Like in, it's like very clearly an app written for multiple operating systems, which is Java. <laughs> no, I, honestly, it, it's fine-ish. Um, there's actually something super interesting. Look at this, because uh, I was looking at this. Um, I mean, since we're talking about it. Look at this. See these two instructions? Right, move this into W8. Move this left shifted 16 into W8. This is at uh, 2.5DC. It's the exact same thing in IDA. Uh, 
Yeah. So it like per, is performing. Uh, I had to ask Fish why this does this. This is what. Whenever you have some operate some weird decompiler thing, you ask Fish, and he knows the answer. Um, Fish said it's an option within Ida of the architecture. You can set some specific option to enable or disable this. It does like instruction coalescing that it can figure out that these two instructions semantically mean this, even though this is not a valid or legal ARM 64 instruction. Possibly. Yeah, I don't know. This is, I mean, I was kind of shocked. This is the first time I've seen like coalescing instructions. Usually this view is like identical to the binary. It is a one to like, maybe like it does, you know, maybe it cleans up these or gives you like nice mnemonics for whatever. Like if you have. Yeah, and also like the stack variables. Like. Yeah, these parts it changes. But anyways, I've never seen like an actual instruction change. So anyways, I thought that was interesting. Um, also, I would, anyways, the point is I know how to use IDA. And so that's what I'm going to use. And uh, that's, that's honestly the main, my main reason is I don't want to have to learn all the key bindings for a new thing. And all of them work? All of them work. All the key bindings work. All the ones I know. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. You've heard like the 80-20 rule. Like each user uses 20% of your system, but each of it's a different 20%. Know, like, a couple of complicated I'm just saying it's uh, I've used like when I was using VS Studio, I tried to use or yeah, Visual Studio way back in the day. It, it has Emacs, you know, you can add an Emacs extension that adds all the Emacs key bindings. But as soon as it doesn't have the one that your fingers know and you don't hit it, you throw it in the trash and you use actual Emacs because it's just like a nightmare. It's like the Visual Studio bin bucket. Mm -hmm. Like one or two binds. Exactly. Like yeah. And once that's not there, it like ruins, shatters the illusion and now you're no longer in your nice environment. So, it's anyways, so easy to change. <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna, we will also, this will be a nice recording of showing people how to do this with Ida if they had Ida. Um, cool. Okay. So, that is why I got this box here. So, we're not, this isn't the production machine that's running all of your stuff. Uh, but this is this little guy here, the Mac Mini. So we're gonna do it on this first. That way I can practice it and we can do it together. And then I'll have to take down the system at some point and apply this to the real thing. Um, okay, so we have, so let's, I'm trying to think if there's any info in here that you shouldn't see, but you know, what are you gonna do? And is there, oh, there we go. Okay. That's interesting. Why is there so many? Huh. All right, whatever. Okay, so these are my virtual machines. We just want to boot up a virtual machine because we're going to actually need one. Uh, I want to show this. And this is what we're using. Um, and I want to do dash G. Okay, so now we won't be messing with this at all. This is uh, just ephemeral. This should boot up. Oh, I hope I don't have to type in the... Uh, maybe I've changed it. Okay. Cool. So this is our virtual machine. Uh, let's... Okay, we need to have a case, a case study. Okay, now... I haven't copied that over. Let's, so I have this great kernel extension here. Um, I want to copy it to, and of course I can't spell these machine names, I-N-I-O. Oh, 
Okay. This is to show you the behavior. You always want to start with like be able to reproduce the error. So if we can't reproduce the error in this environment, we won't know if we're successful. Scale config. Okay. Anybody see an IP address? There we go. Well, this was okay. Copy. Use shared clipboard. Oh, hey, there we go. Look at that. Okay. What do you mean host is down? I'm literally connected to it right now. Ah, uh, okay. I've definitely SSH to this machine before. Screen sharing and remote login. Okay, does that work? Oh, do you think I can't get it because uh, it's on the ASU network? Yeah, I mean, I, it's on tail scale, so I don't understand why it's. Yeah, but I think when I SSH to it, this is the ASU thing. Uh, great, so I need to broadcast all of my tail. Beep boop. Stupid. I mean, that part's fine. I don't really care. But it should be running in the taskbar to just grab. There we go. All right. Just Twitch in an empty screen. Ta-da! Okay. Yeah, so you see the problem was we were both on the same network, and when I just typed in the machine name, rather than using the tail scale name, it used that one, the ASU one, and then ASU wouldn't let me SSH in, which is why I wasn't able to SSH there. Okay. So, I am in here. Now I need to figure out what machine I'm on. Okay, so... That. Okay, so I am, so we're in, so now we're on the host. We have to key, also try to keep these things separate as much as we can. There we go. Sorry, I have to figure out the magic combo that makes it. I can't figure it out. Now this is 192.168.64.7. Sweet. Okay, we're in here as root or as the admin user. 
So now we should be able to rsync AVZP uh, desktop the file. All right, so now we should have that in there. And now we can SSH into the instance. So now we're on the guest. We should be able to see the iPhonekit.ext. Oh, I've also got to change this uh, password. Uh, what's the best way to do that? You guys are really ruining my vibe of adminning these machines. Because, um, like, I don't even know the. Well. Okay. First things first. Let's log out of this guy. Oh, it's not gonna, it doesn't matter. Okay, sorry. Uh, I used ephemeral here when starting this, which means nothing I do is gonna be saved to this instance. It all goes away, which is all of you guys when you start a new instance. This is why everything disappears. Um, okay, so I have this here. And if we drop it in library extensions, this is where you can drop new kernel extensions. We can do that in here, sudo k ext load. So kernel extension load, library extensions iPhone kit. Ah, awesome, okay. So this does not have the right code signature because it's signed by us, which means it's not even gonna ask us to do it. Oh, this is annoying, okay, all right. So we're gonna cheat in a couple ways. We are going to look ahead here. Okay, so we need to uh, we have this, we have this, the VM, we have disassemblers. Oh, I need to install this this thing. Uh, I have this hex header. Don't have a binary diff tool. I think we should use diff. I don't think we need anything else. Uh, okay, don't want to. settings change host and guest. Some settings are required by the host, which allow changes on system. Okay, so this is on the host. Ah, okay, okay, great. These are the two things we need to do here. So we need to disable download new updates when available. So this is on the host. So done. Automatic updates, check for updates. Off, 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 never update. Great, love it. We are never updating. Now we need to boot into recovery mode to do these things. I think this is already done, let's check this. But it doesn't matter, we have to do it anyways. Okay, so this is how you check the system integrity protection. This is the CSR util. Uh, I can't remember what CSR stands for. But now, yes, okay. This is why I brought the monitor, so I could actually see this, but you know, stop following me. <sighs> this just looks like HDMI cable. Oh, I don't want to talk too soon. Can we cancel more of that? Okay. This should be fine. This should get us HDMI. This is not HDMI. Uh, any issues? Maybe I have an HDMI cord. All right. 
first let's turn it off. I'm serious, does anybody have an HDMI? Uh, what is after? Can you? Uh, I don't know if this, this looks, oh, 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 is USB, okay, great, we got USB-C. Where's the call? I already got one. Yeah. Yeah, okay, perfect, okay, great, and I won't lose the cable I was not to lose. I'm really gonna mess up this machine for the next person. Okay, this is our HDMI, that goes back. Somebody remind me to put that back at the end. I probably should have kept it on so I could look at this on. What do we think, are these keys all in here? Is it possible that it's showing me? You guys are going to tell me on here as I'm doing this. Okay, but the only thing plugged into this monitor is this USB C cord, and I see an ASU login. So Ethernet plugged in. Like this doesn't make any sense. Is there any other way to get how in the world? Okay. Third try. So we got that plugged into there. This apparently does nothing, or this is like output. The problem is, this cable, this power brick, is jacked. It does not fit in that over here, and there's no power over here. So, your genius is thoughts. Ooh, good idea. Where is all that plugged in? Look over here first. It's over there. On the wall? Oh, oh, like it. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah, now we're getting into this game of like, how does that get to there? I mean, I guess I can make it all work. I can scoop that. I can scoop that. Oh, up front? Where? You know, walking over here, I kind of thought I'd be like those physics professors and like have them all set up, ready to go. Ooh, never. Look at that. Nope. <laughs> I was so close, team. I've got, I've got a, a cord. Which table? This thing? Yeah. I don't, I don't trust that thing. That looks like it's used for real experiments. That's why I don't trust it. Yeah, okay. Where was that giant cable? I was just Ah, 
freaking display port. And you have a display port to HDMI adapter? Why didn't I check this? <laughs> okay, we got this. We've got, we've got enough. We can make it work. Okay. The tiny cable is too small, but the power cable is large. And therefore, we can do this and this. Power cable barely reaches. Oh, there we go. And this is only HDMI. <laughs> well, this is exactly what I didn't want to happen. Die, you said that like an hour ago. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I, I thought you only need the adapter. I need several. I forgot there's there's several paths to victory, just like in exploitation. Here we go. Probably. Do you keep broken cables in your bag? Uh, hold up. Let me try that cable. <laughs> All right. Let's... Final piece of the puzzle. Yeah, it did come prepared. Run two freaking commands. Showing up there? Showing through a screen. Oh! But oh, maybe I've got a screen in my computer because I'm doing screen sharing. Good, uh, good eye. Look at that, not paying attention to the circuits, paying attention to the whole, the whole shebang. Okay. Okay. Can somebody look up how to reboot into recovery? Click on options. Do you all want to see? Do you want me to turn around the screen? No? Do you want to press into that physical option screen? Yeah. This is the part I should have done, obviously, before I talked. I was worried we'd have to do more stuff. All right. Utilities. Start, uh, not startup, system utilities. So we want utilities terminal. And. We want 
Okay, so we have to disable SIP, which is system integrity protection, and then run the unauthenticated root disable. Okay. And, uh, oh, PSR util disable. If I remember correctly, I think CSR is a, used to be a register on Intel Max, but uh, oh, there we go. Um, but on the Apple Silicon, they changed it so that it's a part of the device root or something. So it's on different hard drives, so you can have different things with different settings, and it's not like a system wide thing. Okay, so we did that, and then we need to do CSR util disable, uh, was it authenticated root disable? Uh, the reason is because we're basically modifying our, we have to modify files that are protected by SIP on our own operating system. That boot zero part of iBoot, like that's running on our host, so we need to change that file, and that allows us to change phases one and two of boot inside the guest VM. So that's why we're doing this whole thing. Only do it in recovery mode. Um, whew, okay. Bum, bum, bum. Okay, great. So, restart the machine for any changes to take up back. Cool, so that should boot up. And let's start the screen sharing so we could see this. Okay, so this is what we need to do on the host. Then in the guest, we need to boot into recovery mode, which is way, way easier, as we'll see. Um, and then we'll run things in there, do similar things. Um, Why is it not connecting? Because I cannot talk to you. Oh, it's connecting to Wi-Fi. Okay, we're almost there. Don't worry. I guess I say it again, it'll work. We're almost there. Don't worry. Seems slower. I feel like boot was faster when it was not. When we couldn't see the screen. Okay, and we can double check that our changes were made. By going CSR util status. System integrity protection disabled. Yay. We can also check the authenticated root status also disabled. All right, so now we need to do this for our So now we need to do this for our VM. Uh, guest will fix this image. Man. Great, okay. This isn't the one I actually use. Uh, so let's there we go. Okay, we don't want to boot up in ephemeral. Now we're just going to boot it up normally, and I'm going to change the admin password to just admin because it's going to be insane typing in the real password. And we'll need to do something similar to the guest, which is what we're going to do now. Okay. Maybe it already still is admin. Admin. 
and pretty please. Goodbye. Do you know what the password for the hacker user is? Hmm? Ah, nobody tried to tried to brute force the password. I don't know. Maybe I left a secret note in what the password is or something. I thought you guys would be curious people. Okay, almost done. I need to get in and lock, change the password. That way we can just go forward. This should be fairly easy. So then, oh, more twenty. Okay. All right. Sorry and everything. Apparently, that guy has a really bad network connection too. It's only one star or two two bars. Okay. The here users, users and groups. Okay. Twitch people, you can't see my screen, right? Good. This feels like very very wrong. Hallelujah, okay. We are good. Let's bring in the people. All right. Do I write that down? Oh, why isn't this bigger? Oh, whatever. Okay, not my problem. Okay, so we need to, now that we've done this, we need to boot into recovery mode. So to do this, we get into our screen sharing. Let's make this bigger so you all can see. And let's make this bigger. Okay, but for first, we just gotta shut it down. And this virtualiz virtualization stuff that I'm using um, has a nice option to open it up in, I think it's dash dash recovery. Maybe that would be a fun thing to do is like dive into this virtualization, this hypervisor thing and see if there's guest to host escapes. Here we are in recovery mode. So we will go options. And if I remember correctly, we need to do two things. Uh, oops, let's go back here. So we need to run startup security utility, choose reduce security, this and CSR disable. Okay, so we need that. Uh, so that is under, at the top here, under utility. Startup system utility. Uh, it's apparently very laggy, okay. And what was the thing it said? Uh, allow user management kernel extensions from identified developers. Hey, that's us. Okay, admin and admin. Do that. Exit out. Nope. Quit start of this. Wow, this is incredibly annoying. Okay. Allow booting unsigned operating systems and any kernel extensions. Yes. All right. 
is the two steps. Ah, oh, look at that. All right, now we shut this down. Okay, what was that, 20 minutes plus of just preamble of getting to where we need to go? Okay, so that's the first thing. The next thing we need to do is to get the modules we need to patch. So the first one is the iBoot stage zero. That's gonna be here. So let's go, cause I want to do this on my local machine cause I'm not a crazy person and I don't wanna use this all the time. Uh, let's go with some patching directory. Now we should be able to get this from What was the IP address? All right, so here's our stage zero. So this is the very first thing that the virtualization framework runs to verify the other phases of the guest. Um, now, oh, interesting. Oh, shit. Okay. This is where things get uh, a little wild. Uh, and this is where I'm slightly worried because we're off of the track of what, uh, like, this is based on UTM and we're using something different. So, exciting times. I can't see any, the chat is still loading. And obviously I do this for the chat, so I haven't seen any. Oh, you got a YouTube video I can follow. Hello, am I the only one chatting in this chat room? Sorry, we were unplugging things. That was 20 minutes ago. You think people want a YouTube follow after the amazing content I've been making today? I think I feel, okay. so. We can figure this out, auxiliary storage. So this maps, so if I was a betting man. Okay. So we'll be using the terminal. Okay, so now we're on the host. It says on the host, and I already had a nice CD. Mac host guest images. Okay, so each of these, this little thing has an auxiliary image format and a disk image format. Um, the auxiliary is only 32 megs and the disk image is 48 gigs. I guess I lied, I didn't get 50 gigs, I get 48 gigs. Um, so, okay. So the second stage bootloader is embedded inside of the auxiliary IMG4 format. It's followed immediately by an IMG format from the, of the logo. You'll need copies of both. If you've upgraded your guest VM to a newer version, I don't think that's true. Okay. So here's the part that I don't know if there's better ways to do this, but we'll try this. So we need to get this file first. So what we need is at uh, Mac host guest images Mac OS. Okay, we need this image file. Very small, easy enough. We need to open it in a hex editor, jump to this offset, check the bytes, otherwise jump to this different offset. So I do have this hex fiend tool that I've never used. Does anybody have a good like hex viewing and editing thing that they've used in uh... Yeah. Yeah. Rehex. Oh. Zoom does not do what I want it to do. Oh, that works out. Okay. Uh uh, where go to go to jump to offset J to jump 
jump to offset, of course, command L. Okay, there's zeros there, which makes sense. So jump here. Okay, it says the byte should be 3083, 3083. Okay, so the first, it said the IMG4 image is in DER format, so the first five bytes are 3085. This number, okay, followed by a three digit hexadecimal number in big Indian format. So that's this three hexa three God, who talks like this three digit okay three digit hexadecimal number in big Indian format 04 DD 38. This is the size, the length of the image, exclusive of the length of its header. Uh, so the total length okay is even more. Um, select the first five bytes of the image, then cho choose extend selection. Uh, so first five, oh, this way, one, two, three, four, five. So is this just five delta here? Yeah, so this is 37 FD1, 37 FD6. So apparently this is just the header, those two magic bytes, and then a three byte size. Extend selection. Extend selection by, and I want to move the selection by uh, 0x4DD38. So now I'm selecting all of those bytes that should be this image, select the first five times. Scroll down to the end of the selection, check that it's in the collect, correct location just before a logo image. So scroll down. Keep scrolling. Oh, scrolled too much. 3082, these are the magic bytes, right? That specified that, and this must be the length of this other thing. Okay, yeah, the header should be that, followed by a two-digit hexadecimal number, 36 dB. Select the first, wait, wait, I don't know, we skipped a step. If it is, control C to copy the image, control N to open a new window. Wow, I've never actually done. We're just yoinking things out of files and then copying them. All right, I kind of like it. Save the file as LLB in far ridge. Wait, wait. This is the new one. Okay. And the header for the logo image is that select the first four bytes, extend the selection by the size bytes. Okay. And then, so I want these bytes, extend 36. You guys are all watching me to make sure I don't make typos, right? Okay, copy. I said, guess it says, oh, zeros at the end. Yep, okay, copy, new, face, save. This is wild. Like, gotta be a way to just like do this, right? Okay, so now we have stage one. Now stage two and the kernel cache. These modules are stored in files on the VM. So run the VM and do the following in it. So now we have to now go into the, the virtual machine itself. So let's start it up. Okay, I don't want recovery. There we go. I bet it'd be the same. Let's see if it's the same IP. Oh, I think it won't be because it uh, uses different MAC addresses. It randomizes MAC addresses, which I know because I had the problem where I was giving two of your virtual machines the same MAC address. And that was why at the first start when some of you weren't getting files dropped correctly, it was because they got dropped on the other machine that you SSH into the other machine. Yeah, networking. OK. 
Okay, this is dot 10. All right, we are here in this machine. So we need iBoot.image4 and kernel cache. These modules are stored in files on the VM. So run the VM and do the following in it at a terminal prompt. Run kmutil inspect. So this is uh, shows you information about the kernel extensions that are in there. The following is the example. The past exact contents will differ from case to case. Oh, the kernel cache. Okay, so. <coughs> ah. So at the top here, it says boot kernel collection at, I think this is, yeah, exactly what we need. It's good kernel cache. Note the long, oh gosh, okay. Note the long hexadecimal number just before system library caches in this case. Duh, okay. Do I have anything important in my scratch? Uh, Okay, we'll store this here. Hello. All right. Okay, note the long has a decimal number just before system library caches. In this case, blah, well, this is the next stage image for hash, NSIH, observable in the output of pseudo BPU tilde D. Copy this file and rename it to kernelcache.org. Yes, sir. Okay. All right, and then we need to get it back to our machine. So we need to, well, let's, I guess if we need to get two files, we can just do that at once. So, okay. CD slash, why would you need to do CD to do this? Okay. Uh, pseudo find. Okay, we need to find this. There'll be at least two hits. Choose the one whose path contains the next stage image for hash. So I could probably, if I was smart, just do this. Something like that. There we go. This here. Oh, I think that's it. Look at that. We should time ourselves. And when I say ourselves, I mean me. Okay, but now we need to get these off. So now we need to colon i boot img4. I think the other one was just called kernel cache. Now that those are here, get them local. Come on, the machine is right there. Okay, well, of course, while this is loading, we will not waste time. Patching these modules, yay! So, uh, here's the first thing where we got to uh, patch. So this is patching out the checking in stage zero of stage one. I think if you find, if you go up, you can figure out exactly what these things are, what the functions names that he thinks these are that are getting patched. Okay, we got the kernel cache. I boot. All right, look at this. Now, okay, now 
now we have the originals, copies of the originals. This should be good. All right, so stage zero. Okay, we're not gonna use Ghidra. I have used Ghidra. There's actually, um, there is a, so there's this Ghidra iBoot plugin. I don't know everything that it does. There's actually also a plugin for Ida that does, like figures out where to rebase the binary because the thing to remember about this, like stage zero is a blob that just like, like is the very first thing that gets booted. So um, where it actually lives, all those semantics are kind of like hardware dependent, but people have kind of tried to reverse engineer this. Uh, I don't know if it's on specs or what. Um, and I've already done it here, but we're not happy with that because we're going to, uh, I guess we can use nine, right? Uh, that should be fine. Okay, so let's go into patching. We have AVP booter uh, VM Apple, so virtual machine Apple. So this is the version of the kernel that is made to run in virtual machines. Okay, and we can say this is the secure ROM. This is the uh, what the extension does. So we can specify this. We can specify that it's little endian. Uh, there's like, see, like I said, you can specify ARM kernel options. Uh, edit ARM architecture. I don't know. Maybe there's something else that Fish was talking about in here. Oh, maybe this one, scattered move T, move W pairs analysis. That actually sounds like the thing that we were looking at. Or, just, or simplify instructions here. Um, click the button. So it figures out that it loads at it, the address hex 100000. Uh, sure, search for known iBoot functions. So we can see here on the bottom, it's, our, it's got some heuristics to look for things like panic, uh, task init, USB core init. Um, and so we can look at start. So this is start. Uh, I think a tip is that like looking at this super early boot code, it's not very useful to look at the decompilation because it's probably written in assembly because it's the first thing that runs. So like you can see in here, it's like writing the status registers and like doing other stuff that it can't do correct decompilation of. And it's probably looping over some addresses and doing some things, but like a lot can get, uh, like the decompilation of this is not gonna be good because it probably was not C to begin with for a lot of this. Um, but we can go, yeah. Um, anyways, so it's doing stuff, comparing things, jumping to places, doing things, uh, but let's not dig in this too much. So we want to look for this so I don't know why, but the person found out that this specific reference is in a function that we need to patch this uh, 4447. And I believe we can do search text, type that in. And we'll see this here. And this is where I mentioned, uh, this is at 253C, that this instruction has been coalesced between two other instructions, uh, which Ghidra does not do. And uh, yeah, and then we want to search for so re uh, we haven't got there yet, but we're going to search for ret ab, which is the return of this function. So we're looking for the return here. Uh, ret ab is a pack instruction to return and check pointer signatures and stuff. Um, so if we do text, should see here. And if all went according to plan, what was LDUR? Load register, what's the U? Unsigned, okay, cool. So we can see that the the variable names are different, right? Because it's a different, it's using Ghidra on the right and Ida on the left. 
We just want to do a check that this is roughly the same. This address is not the same, which is, you know, maybe kind of interesting. Um, uh, but what was that? Oh, the at page offset is what's doing the difference. Oh, interesting. Oh, interesting. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah, 140. Huh. Okay. See, we learn something new about Ida every day. Um, and then we can kind of go forward and even get from here. So loading this, comparing things. Uh, jumping, and then if that doesn't jump, we move x20 into zero. So this is our return address, right? Or return value of this function. So we're returning x0. And this is what we're going to patch out. So we're gonna, just going to make this function always return true. So this must be the authentication something check. We're just going to say everything's all good. Okay. Now this is the part that I don't quite remember how to do in Ida. So we will, or you will help me. Okay, so it's synced with, so we know this is the instruction. I don't know enough about uh, ARM instructions to actually like do this. But if we do, let's see, patch program. Is it assemble? Okay. So, somebody remember how to do this? Yeah. Ah, <laughs> cheaters. Hmm? But what bytes to change? I have all the bytes. I can do edit and edit any of these bytes. This is the instruction. So it highlighted these four because it's mapped to the to the assembly view. Yes, that's what was what I was going to do. Is so we need to figure out. We want this to be move instead of x. We want to move zero into x zero, right? Um, or we could like I guess change it to x or x zero x zero x zero, but like something like that, right? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sure there's a way to do this in Ida. I, uh, you know, and I think that is the way to do it. There's the um, it's probably because we didn't specify like what assembler to use or like Ida just doesn't know how to assemble it necessarily. Um, Bin utils is clang based and may not work. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, mm. like, like, yeah, that's what I was going to do next. Okay. Online tool? Pro? Do I trust you well enough to just type enter in the middle of a class on a random website? Which one? How many S's? Where are the S's? 
Okay. Okay. For hackers, we'll figure it out. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I told you I'm running and I've disabled almost every security <laughs> thing on this because I was testing. This has no SIP, it has no nothing, it has a uh, running of an intentionally vulnerable kernel extension. Uh, wait, I already have a test.s. Uh, no, I want to show everyone how to get the bytes. <laughs> Are you doing it on your phone, the dis-s pro? <laughs> Maybe uh, ASU is blocking it or something. Is it the same? Are you sure? Okay. Look at that. We tried 10 different ways, just like the monitor, and the one, we found one that works. That is the essence of hacking. Okay. And so, now we go to hex view, and now we know, of course, I'm not quite sure if big Indian, little Indian, we'll just do it this way, and then we can always do it backwards. I think you right click, Say edit, and you go D2800000. And then you hit uh, apply changes. And then I think you go into IDA, and it tells you that this is not an instruction. So this would mean that your Indianness is Indian wrong. And then you would go here, edit, zero. AD. Yeah. ADD2. And then you apply changes. And then you. Hmm? Cancel. Stop it. Hey. Good job. All right, move zero into X zero. We've now patched it and, oh, it is connecting now at least. I understand the risks. I'm a risk person. I feel like this is a site that's just trying to pop my machine or something. All right. Okay, so we've patched this. Great. And then we need to export the patch. Wait, oh, that's not what we want. That's what we want. Was it what? It's different bytes, though. <laughs> All right. What? It should be, yeah. <laughs> definitely too many bytes. How can it be from the new lines once? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. That's where it's okay. All right. So we just did. Okay, now we need to save it, right? Uh, which in Ida, if I remember, patch program, apply patches to input file. And that will change this, put it there. 
whole thing. Create backup. I don't know why that's not uh, checked by default. Cool. Hmm? Yeah. I don't really know. Did they see the screen down there? Okay. Uh, Good, good eye. That did not get applied. But why? Anybody remember why? This is like every DEF CON. I go through the same problem. Oh, oh, wait, wait. I think it's like this. Original files. No. No, this is to like dump the file. No. Uh, there is, but that's not like what it means. This is the idea. Did, did somebody just suggest Ghidra? Wait, it says has no file mapping. No. The file's right here. I wonder if it's because this extension doesn't properly do the mapping. Because it rebased it here. Um, let's do this. I bet if we do something like segments. Rebase program at zero. Yeah, I don't care. Okay. And now. What does that mean? It has no file map. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Use this tool. Use a better tool. How about we do this? This is called old school. Where was, okay. These were the original. You guys, yeah, it looks it looks right. Let's <laughs> double check before we just start changing raw bytes, please. Wait. Yeah, I see that. That's. Overwrite, there we go. Nope. This is the work, the problem with all these tools. How do you know, like, okay, zero, zero, zero. Think eight. <laughs> zero must be like a special name. Yeah, wait, okay. I 
What was that? Oh, since we have it uh, over here, maybe. Oh, shit. <laughs> Almost works. Okay, we know how to do zeros. This is definitely the way you're supposed to do this. D0, just give me a D0. Okay. Saved. Hey, different. Is that the correct different? We'll find out. <laughs> okay, we don't have to do this three more times, so cool. Okay, stage one, boom, one out of four, three files. Okay, lb.image4, all the other modules that need patching are wrapped in IMG4 format. So to get their actual content, you need to use the image4 tool to unpack them. Okay, how do I install you? Like this, okay, that's how everyone likes code. Uh, Baby, just worked. There we go. Don't have to do any work installing this. I did not mean this. I meant this tool. I think I already have this somewhere. Um. Nope. Yeah, I thought I, okay, well. Surely nothing bad can come from downloading something and just running build and install scripts. Still don't understand Ida. That definitely should have worked. There's no. No package lib general found. For sure, thought this was uh, this was gonna be easy. Um, okay, we're not we're not don't don't count us out yet. know a nice online site for all of this. Let's see if I can quickly install it on a Linux box. I should just see if this thing is working. This is insanity. 
Okay. Oh, wait, wait. Mm, tools for launchpad boards. That seems not what we want. Oh. Okay. Install this thing. Oh, okay. I never really trust that, but that's fine. I'm beyond, beyond trust. Oh, there we go. Great. Just random stuff, huh? Will you work? Please, please, please. What was this? Oh, build group. Oh, that auto. No, oh, wait, this is, I'm on the wrong machine. Statically linked. We'll see. I was going to say tune in next week, but tune in right now. Okay. All the other modules that need patching are wrapped in the IMG format. So you have the actual content you need to use this to unpack them. Then you'll patch them and rewrap them into new IMG4 files. So we're going to do this. A bunch. Okay, so okay, so let's. Oh, we already have that. Okay, great. Wow, these are like different by like one character in several places. Ho 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 ho. Look at that. Running random commands. Okay. The iBoot stage one module should now be in llbbin.org. Copy it to llbbin and patching according to the instructions for the stage zero binary. Oh, it's the same instructions? That seems weird, doesn't it? We're gonna we're gonna do it better this time because we are better and we learn from our mistakes. Okay. I am not loading it with this loader. I think that was the problem. Yes, I want to disassemble it. I just loaded a binary file. Correct. But I know that that's code, and this code, this whole thing is code, just Ooh, okay, I see why this is becoming a pain. Uh, I did cheat and read the uh. I think, let's look at the extension. I read the code of this extension because it wasn't working. Uh, when it's finding the base address, it looks for the first load instruction in the first several things and then uses that address and it says this is what the rebase should be. So let's do a segment. Uh, 
do like all code, like keep going. Okay. So now it looks like all the functions seem like they're good. Uh, where was, the, okay. And now we need to what, search for that same thing. So uh, search. Okay, here's the same check. Ooh, I'm starting to like. Oh wait, okay. Now I can't know that that was the one that came from there. Okay, great. Search, checks. Okay, the next red AV. This looks familiar, except here it's x21 instead of x0. Do we need new hex values? No, we don't because we need to do the same thing, zero into x0. That was a trick. We could do this in our sleep. Look at us. Huh? Uh, other one was x20 into x0. No, it was x20. Yeah, because it was a register, like whatever it calculated up above in that function. So 0, 0, 0, 0, 80. What was the last one? I don't remember. D2? Do I trust you? There we go. Look at that. Okay. This is where. This is for sure going to work. Hey! Screw that, that freaking library or whatever. Plugin? Sorry, I'm losing my mind. Uh, applied. Four out of four patches. Look at that. that look at how much time we saved. <laughs> All right, bam, just really blazing on through. Okay, did that. Okay, we did all this. Okay. Okay, copy it to in, patch it, okay. If you've upgraded macOS in your guest VM from a version that you already patched, this and this may still contain your previous patch. They do not. That would be insane if that was the case. Uh, in this case, you don't need to repatch it. Okay, great. Run image for tool this, which will produce output something like what follows. Use that information from it to run the next command, the value for desk differs from one version to the other. Note that you do not want to use compression even though IMG4 tool supports it. It uses Apple's law to implement its compression even though it's the same, it's the, okay, well, do I, do I care? Just tell me the options. Okay, this, compile the plist. Desk, iBoot, this is iBoot version 7459141.1. Uh, this makes sense. This looks like a much newer guest than I think we're used to. Um, oh, and, but we need to make sure that that matches. So that matches there. So we have to change that value. Okay. And then. Boom, llb.image4. Look at that, halfway through patching stage four. Took us less time to patch this stage than it took to find an HDMI cable that was in the room with us. <laughs> okay, the patched uh, iBoot stage one module should now be shown there. iBoot stage two, once again, you'll need to unwrap the iBoot stage two binary, patch it, then rewrap it. Well, we're old hats at this. 
Oh no, but this time the process is more complicated. iBoot iam4p.org contains a pay p structure taxed onto its end that you'll need to append to iboot.iam4p by hand. That does not seem like fun. But let's see. Okay. Uh, I did not name this correctly. Go like this. Copy iboot and four. Okay. Boom. Extract. Extract. Okay. Here's how to copy the pay p structure from iboot imp4 im4p.org to a separate file, which you'll later append to iboot.im4p. Okay. Huh? The, these? Yeah, I was just copying this directly. So as long as the input file was correct, I think these all just should do stuff. But I've read through the comments here. The person who created these instructions runs them on every single new release of uh, the new operating system and betas to see if they fix, if they don't need to be run and to see if the instructions still work. So I was, I did at least read enough to like parse through it that way. Okay, wow. Outputs the entire file in human readable format. The pay structure appears at the end and looks something like this. Okay. Oh, pay P is probably what I want to look for. Wow, okay, so, oh, right here. Okay, so we're looking at what offset it is here in this file. I have absolutely no idea what this output is, but this just outputted a bunch of stuff. Here's the pay P structure. And now we're going to where the start of this is at the count zero up here. We're gonna then use XXD to extract this from the binary starting here. Wow, okay. I trust you, we've gone this far. You won't let us down. And now we have this format in just complete hexadecimal. It's a hex dump and now compute, now putting it back into binary. Now will we check the contents of it? Okay. Great. That's the same as what we had before. This const zero looks similar-ish of whatever the heck this is. This feels like a, one of those like MISC CTF challenges where you're like unwrapping things and then it's a tar file and then it's an archive and then it's an ext4 file format and then it's a... Okay, now copy iboot.bin.org to iboot.bin. Yes, I, I. Then patch out the call to validate boot object. As mentioned above, you can do this instead of patching out image for validate property callback. Okay, so we're gonna be doing this. The steps, uh, lots of reverse engineering and lots of other write-ups and stuff. So there's, uh, they use the, um, uh, one nice thing is the Asahi like Linux people, like the people that are making Linux that runs native on uh, Apple Silicon, uh, they've done a ton of reverse engineering of the boot process because they need to understand it. And so they have like these file formats and these kind of things. Also the jailbreaking community is really good at understanding these kind of file formats and stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I highly recommend like reading through the original issue that I mentioned of like watching the reverse engineering process as it's going. And you just realize like, my God, because that's what I was thinking is like, I'm going to have to debug why this isn't working. And like, thank God I like <coughs> Googled for it and found somebody else that went through the pain and documented what they found. And uh, it was much better. Okay. Uh, I did not. I didn't want to look at that because I didn't want to get us into any kind of, this is we're just editing files on our own computers and our own stuff without looking at anything that may or may not. Yeah, I think they they probably did that, but I don't know. <laughs> they didn't release it. Okay. 
Okay, let's try loading this. So we need to load iboot.bin. Okay, now this is where I'm not sure if this will work. Because it does know that it's an iBoot. I think we can do the same tricks. Let's try. Because trying is always better. You just loaded a binary file. How do you feel now? Okay, and this should do the same thing. The first LVR, yep, that's there. That should be. Edit segments, rebase program. There we go. Okay, and but the problem is it says that we need to, okay, in the Ghidra code browser, search for instruction patterns, then edit bytes and input mode hex. Copy the above two lines of hexadecimal code, and put it into the edit, what? Choose apply. So you search all, you should find one hit with the code. Okay, so we're looking for these byte values, something like move x4 into x5, move zero into w4, then B0. Okay. So we're going to look for, and if I, okay, search for sequence of bytes. I think it's something like this. Uh, yeah. Okay. Some function. Different offsets, obviously, but move x4 to x5, uh, move 0 into w4, branch to somewhere else. That's looking good, yeah. And then, is this the next line? Why is that included in here? Yeah, I guess that's the start of the next function. Okay, so we found it. You should find one hit with code that looks like this. Double click on the cross reference. It should take you to code that looks like this. So this is what? Do you th wait, what? Oh, here? Ah, okay. So it wants us to go where this is called. And it should look something like this. Let's see, this is the function call, branch of link. So it looks, add that. Yep, okay, that looks good. All right. Okay, so it wants us to basically knock out this function call and replace it with a move zero x zero, which is great because we already know the instructions for that. We can do this by hand, but we want the BL, uh, this one. Okay, hex view. Edit zero 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 eight zero d two. Oh, look at that! Bam. Apply changes. Look here. Move zero into x zero. No call anymore. Okay. On recent versions of Mac OS, there may be more than one cross reference. In this case, you double tuck on each one in turn. Okay, I didn't. We didn't see any more. Export it. Overwrite it. Oh, which will work, patch program, apply patches to input program, create backup, click OK. Applied, four out of four patches, boom. Double checking that our thing actually did what we wanted it to do. Exit, save, pack database. Look at that, this one was hard. Oh, this next part's gonna be hard, I think. Um, okay, run this, which will produce output something like this. Use this information from it to run the next command. The value of desk differs from one version of macOS to the other. Okay, so we're gonna do this. Okay, the size. What was it? Okay, so I think what we need from here is just the, yeah, that string. Okay, so let's do this. Okay. 
Okay, DD. Why use, can you specify the output file with the DD command? I guess it's appending, so it's, yeah, I think it's because it's appending maybe here is why you don't want an output file. Okay. I'll use our boy hex fiend to open this and correct its length value. Okay. Oh yeah, because that's the thing I just messed up. Okay. Boom, look at this beautiful, beautiful hex. Okay. Observe its five byte header and length value. 30, there's the header length. Convert the length to decimal and add 30. Okay, we just added 30 bytes. Okay. All right. So we have calculator. What? Paste doesn't work? Okay. 0547D3. So we have this. We'll go here because that's easy. Plus 30. Go here. Go back. 547F1. And. Okay. Correct it. So then change it. Okay. So we need F1. And because everything is stupid, I'm, and we haven't found a better way to do that. Go here. Mode overwrite. All right, we've just overwritten it. Okay, save it. All right. All right. Second stage, right? Oh, we never actually showed that we couldn't load a kernel module, but all right. Last step. Are we ready? Yes? All right. As with the iBoot stage two module, you'll need to unwrap the kernel cache and, and rewrap it. So I need to, I think I don't have the right names. Yeah, I just call it kernel cache, kernelcache.org, which sounds like a website. Um, okay, kernel cache like this has a pay P structure. All right, we're getting really good at this uh, pay P structure. Oh, this is the entire kernel cache. There's the PP. Wow, that's a large offset. Okay. Oh, we have to do the XXD dance. Oh, that's not what we want. We want this number here. And then change it here. If any of this messed up, it's some of your faults, just so we're clear. Okay, binary, check the contents by running the following commands. All right. Now copy kernel cache bin org to kernel cache.bin. Oh, look at this. Look at your precious Ghidra now. Man, they're so desperate. They're using, suggesting you use Hopper. And, yeah. That's what I used like 10 years ago when I first got here. Um, mm. Oh, look at that, because it's already got. So yeah, this is the cool thing, because I have played with this. You have different loaders, so you can um, get the entire kernel, you can load the entire kernel with all the kernel extensions or just choose, I think, a single kernel extension or just do the kernel. Um, this is where I think, you know, part of the way that Ida shines is because it has 
it knows how to handle these formats like a kernel cache and keep them up to date with every version because the people that buy IDA really want this functionality. Um, but let's see, okay, so on loader, so this is saying we need to do com apple security apple vp boot policy is the thing that we want. Um, so I think it's okay if it's just this single kernel extension. So let's try that, aha. Boom. Okay, so it looted, looted, it loaded that up for us. Uh, we need this label validate ACM context. <coughs> oh no. Uh, Okay, let's see, we can go to view, open sub views, functions. This is the function view. We can, how do you just, oh, control F. Ah, there we go. Ooh. Oh, underscore, underscore, wow, that's annoying. Okay, so this is a function that, ooh, it has some asserts in it, great. It even tells us boop, boop. Um, Okay, ACM error success. Empty, okay. Okay, it takes you to the function whose top few lines should look like this. Um, I mean, this is for sure that, but let's double check because I'd hate to go all the way here. I think that's very clearly the same, but let's. Yep. Yep, looking good. Okay, you want to find the calls to validate ACM context from these functions and patch out each one by replacing it with a NOP instruction. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I thought this was interesting. I think this. Whoa. Yeah, I think. Um, this person did some tests and they tried just nothing out this function itself, but that caused too many other changes and caused it to fail. And so what they did is figured out which calls were actually important and just knock out those two calls rather than knock out that function itself. Why this is, I don't, I don't know, but um, there's a lot more symbols in here. It's a lot easier than dealing with the boot, um, the boot thing. So we want to go to command create linked manifest. Command create linked manifest. And we need a NOP. Give me a NOP. That's incredibly annoying, but. Why in the world is a knob so complicated? I don't know, but we'll, we won't find out because we don't care. All we're here is to patch. Okay. Branch and link, edit, 1F2003. Okay, double check, apply changes, go back to Ida view, NOP. All right, goodbye. Oh no. Ah, goodbye call to validate ACM context. Okay, and we need to do another one to command. Wait. We did linked manifest, we need local policy for. This one, Kcos, okay, and let's go hex, edit, 1F, 
two zero zero three D five. Okay, right click, apply changes, check, nop. Oh, we're nopping so good. Yeah, this is the same thing twice, right? Well, I think it's telling you how to do it. It's just like the, I see. Wait, wait, we're almost there, we're almost there. Ignore all the other stuff that's remaining. Okay, this is just saying how to do this. We did this. Oh, we even have the bytes in here. Look at that. Okay, we did that and that. Okay, save it. Oh, Ida, don't fail me now. Okay, patch program, apply patches. Seems like a lot of patches. <laughs> uh, uh, what? I mean, how bad could that be? <laughs> it it seems seems real seems real bad. <laughs> okay. So Is it gonna produce the right file even? Okay. Go where? Yeah, there's still tons. Okay, anybody know a good binary dipping tool? Wait, what? <laughs> on the kernel cache? Okay. Yeah. Oh my god. This feels like a terrible idea. Yeah, that's bad. This is very bad. What? I mean, you are technically correct. <laughs> I would probably not want to do that. Let's, instead of doing that, because this, yeah, I'm not even sure that this back is correct. Are we? Oh, this is the one. I just need to make sure that this is actually. OK, so this is the original. Well, back to our good old friend Hexfiend and start batching stuff manually. OK, that was definitely a big Ida fail. It must be because we opened up just that one module or something. But like, why would it touch all those bytes? That seems 
not what you want. Okay, but what we can do is copy that back so we have the original back. And then open kernel cache.bin. And then and then we need to figure out the offset here, which is probably, I mean, okay, we have all the bytes, uh, the bytes view, cache bytes. Yeah. So I would guess that's probably the bytes. Let's look. Uh, L. Oh. Uh, it probably did it because of the kernel cache stuff is probably, is my guess. Um, so how do we see where this is in the uh, edit segments? Wow, that's incredibly annoying. Okay. So what if I take this, subtract that? Oh, yeah. I'm probably doing this the wrong way, but. Okay, and we can look at the original bytes. No. Oh. oh, okay. Ideas? Hmm? Hopper, we're not gonna use Hopper. Oh, we've entered like a meme zone that I don't know how to extract from. I definitely do not want to do this next week. I also don't want to do this on my own. Yeah, but how? Oh, 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 what if? No, we couldn't rebase to zero. That wouldn't make sense. Do you think there's a way to look at what? Yeah. In where? Hmm. Yeah. Uh, this module is not at zero. This is like one kernel extension in that whole file. So it's not located at zero. It's some. Um, the patch, let's see, 89614. Yeah, this patch is the. The loaded address. Oh, well, maybe we could try. It's probably close enough if we. These are the bytes that we changed. If we like search for these in. That's kind of insane. You on this and then the two F, the AA, and then it's A two two F zero zero nine four. Oh, look at that. Who needs Ghidra now? Look at us <laughs> flying. Okay, and we need to edit mode overwrite. Okay, and then take me here. Okay. Who would want
want the column copy. Oops. Okay, edit. Wait, okay, we have this up here. I think it's at the end of the AA. Yeah, AA. And then this, let's check the patch bytes. 6D240049. Yes. Boom, look at that. Why in the world is this so difficult? Okay. No. Okay. So close, okay. New executable, did it. Okay, we'll finish after this. Uh, okay. What's this? The... Oh, six byte. Oh, that's much bigger. Right, one, two, three, four, five, six. I think that's right. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. That quarter address will add one eighty nine. Okay. Oh, okay. The length. Four, it's a four byte length. Good call. What? Yeah. Gotta keep you on your toes. You thought we were at the end. You're getting complacent. Okay, so we have that. Is our payload gonna be the same? I think so, right? Add. I think so. Should we see what that size is? Yeah, it's gotta be the same, right? One eighty nine. Decimal plus one eighty nine. Back here, edit, mode, overwrite, boom. That's not right. There we go. Oh my God, you could like fail in so many ways. Okay. All right, got the kernel cache. Copying the patch modules to their final destinations. iBoot stage zero, AVP booter VM Apple bin is a system file. By default, it's protected. So you need to make a directory here. Okay. 
What do you think? Should we just do it? Uh, uh, all right. I think we have to call it right now because I know some people have to go. I'll, we'll blame it on the HDMI cable. <laughs> if we had that 15 minutes earlier, we would have sailed through this. All right. I'll update you guys that this actually did work. We did all the patching. Look at us. Look at us. Wow. This is horrible.